question really that we've been focusing on here is what type of a being is God? Mm -hmm. And the, the Athanasius Creed clearly says that the type of being that God is is incomprehensible. We do not, we have a, a something which is three separate beings repeatedly throughout the New Testament and I have always assumed that evangelicals truly believed that, that they were three separate beings. The problem is then they also believe that they are also only one being as Dr. Morley has put in. And I mean that in a matter of substance, not just a, a oneness of unity. Now, let me finish my point. The point is this. The, con the idea, the entire idea, that God is incomprehensible in this manner, we think is clearly unbiblical. And I would cite you to um, John chapter 4, verse 22. I'm, I'm right here in which Christ was speaking to the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. And he said, Ye know not what you worship. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And the problem is that if God is incomprehensible, then you know not what you worship, and are therefore just like the Samaritans. It's, it's a, to, see, the, the thing that's so sad to us when we see this being taught is that we we see a situation where, as as Christ said in the um, uh, the great uh, prayer for his disciples, the intercessory prayer in John chapter seventeen, he said in verse three, "This is life eternal to know God and Jesus Christ." So if we assume that they are incomprehensible, as the creeds teach, then we have eliminated the possibility of us knowing God and Jesus Christ. Okay, Doctor Morey, this point does require clarification. Then some final comments by Dale. All right, number one, I don't think you understand the Athanasian Creed, which came out in 490. We worship one God in Trinity, in Trinity and Unity. The Father, in the literal, says infinite. Now, there was a translation that came out in the 19th century, which had the word incomprehensible, but that was a mistranslation. It should read, the Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Ghost infinite. They are not three uncreated, but three infinites but one uncreated and one infinite. So likewise, the Father is omnipotent, the Son omnipotent, the Holy Ghost omnipotent, the Son of God is God and man begotten before all worlds. Uh, perfect God, perfectus Deus. I cover this in my book, Battle of the Gods, on page 273. I also have a chapter, and if I have a copy of the book, I'd like to give it to you, where I go through all of the scriptures in the Old and New Testament which explicitly state that God is incomprehensible. It can be the little verses which says, for example, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. It exceeds the ability of man to understand it. That's found in Philippians 4, 7. Or Ephesians 3, 19. The love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. Or again, Romans 11, where it says, His judgments are unsearchable, His ways unfathomable. And that's a nautical term, meaning you can never plumb the depths and find the end of God. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or has become His counselor? And then you find in Isaiah 40, uh, for example, his understanding is inscrutable. The Hebrew word meaning that you simply cannot fathom it. Psalm 145 in verse 3. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I go through, I think, 25, 30 passages which teaches that God is incomprehensible, though that was not the point of the Athanasian Creed. And I would like you to augment that statement because it's also important to recognize that God has condescended to reveal himself through the personal work of Jesus Christ. Yes, the incomprehensibility of God as taught by the Christian church simply means any God that you could completely understand would be less than you. And this is why I believe the Mormon gods are not gods. They are finite. I can understand Adam, and I understand that the Mormons say that he became God. Well, those kinds of finite gods are comprehensible, and thus Mormonism, taking up after Campbellism, where they got that doctrine too, uh, says that if you have a finite God, of course you can understand him, because, and I quote now from Joseph Smith, uh, what man is, God once was, and what God is, man shall be, I can understand myself. 
So of course then I can understand those finite gods. It's only in the Christian view that you have an infinite God that that God would be in incomprehensible because the mind of man cannot contain the infinite. And Dale, I want to say real quickly too that you've had a bad experience within the church, but not everyone within the church who is purporting to be preaching Christian doctrine really is preaching Christian doctrine. And there are many who are friends of relatives of yours, as you've indicated over the line, who are preaching abominations in the name of Christianity. And the Bible says very clearly, from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. And people like Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin and, and you got Benny Hinn now, and uh, all these people are teaching aberrations of Christianity, heresies. And if you draw some of these heresies out to their logical conclusion, you end up in the uh, kingdom of the cults as well. So I would uh, be very careful that you read the text in context, that you're careful to read the Bible carefully, and that you don't just listen to everyone that purports to be Christian, because walking into a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into a garage makes you a car. But Hank, it's always, in the Christian world, it's always the other guy that's teaching the aberration. Well, your opinion is no better than mine. The real issue is, what does the scripture say? And you need to be very careful not to to compromise or twist what the scripture says and I would really recommend that you stay on the line get a copy of the tape and listen to what you said I'll send it out to you free of charge I need to be fair to Richard Richard some comments and we'll go to our next caller all right uh, the I hope that the uh, listeners have written down the scriptures that uh, Dr. Morley uh, has uh, given us there on the incomprehensibility incompreh uh, and read them for themselves because I'm sorry, Dr. Moray. Yes, I've got that. Um, <clears throat> read those for, the, for yourselves because uh, not one of them communicates the incomprehensibility of his character and what type of a being he is uh, that uh, Dr. Moray suggests is the case here. Uh, of course, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Are his it, things that... Uh, and I, I might add that uh, uh, computers and automobiles would have been just about as incomprehensible uh, to the people in the New Old Testament to whom some of these statements were made as, as uh, uh, I mean, I think we could say that of those things. Well, we'll I mean, leave our listeners with that challenge. The, 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 yeah, read, read it for yourself. But let me give you what in my mind is a very serious problem with the idea that um, there was only the three. The, um, take a look at Psalms 45, 6, and 7. It says there that Jesus Christ was anointed above his fellows. Now, if you assume that his fellows were only the Father and the Holy Ghost, then you have but him anointed above them and exalted above them. Unfortunately, due to time limitations on radio, I want to rip through some callers as quickly as we can, in fairness to them. Rex, no California, KFIA, Rex, you're with us. Hi, Hank. Sorry yeah, to I'm keep sure you waiting. You great job. Thanks. I admire the courtesy that you've extended to one another. It's been fabulous to listen to uh, you trialogue, I guess you would say, in this case. <laughs> and I sincerely appreciate uh, Mr. Hopkins uh, representing the Mormon Church. He's, he's just done a great job. Uh, in the interest of time, I have two quick questions, and I would like to yield the rest of my time to uh, the trialogue between you three. <laughs> my questions are this. Uh, has the Mormon Church ever taught that Jehovah is the son of Elohim? Question number one. And the second question is, was the book of Abraham translated correctly by Joseph Smith? Okay, Richard, you first, please, quickly. And I've tried to stay out of this whole conversation so that we can expedite things, but please go ahead. This will be very easy. Yes and yes. Okay. Um, I, I don't know whether I should leave it at that. We have a Jehovah, we believe, is the name of Jesus Christ as a spirit prior to his being um, placed in the physical body that, that we uh, saw him here upon the earth. Uh, he was the spirit son of Elohim, God the Father, and he was also the physical son of Elohim uh, when he was uh, born here upon the earth. Um, the book of Abraham... 
Uh, I know that there are criticisms of the book of Abraham uh, because uh, there is some idea that we have uh, found the original text from which it was taken, and there are some conflicts with respect to how that text is translated. Uh, I am not an expert in that field, uh, but from what I have read, I do not believe that, uh, that the claims of evangelicals with regard to this are based upon fact. Okay, Robert Morey? Um, I would agree first, yes. They did say Jehovah was the son of Elohim. They can find no scripture for this whatsoever. I think it's insanity in terms of the usage of the terms. Having to do with the book of Abraham, yes, the manuscript was found. The Mormons then, it was given to them by, I believe, the University of Chicago. It was then given to the Mormon church, and they asked D.J. Nelson uh, to do the translation from the hieroglyphic. When he did, he discovered to a chagrin uh, that it, the entire thing was a fraud. I have before me his resignation letter from the Mormon church and the Mormon priesthood, and I quote, I, D.J. Nelson, do hereby renounce and relinquish the priesthood which I now hold following my translation of the bulk of the Herak and hieroglyphic Egyptian texts upon the Metropolitan Joseph Smith papyri fragments. He goes on to say, these amply prove the fraudulent nature of the book of Abraham in which lies the unjust assertion that Negroes are unworthy participants in the highest privileges of the LDS Church. And may, I close with that. May yeah. I just respond quickly it to that? Must very, quickly. Be very quickly. There we is, have about 10 seconds. There is no clear evidence that the uh, document that uh, was given to him uh, was, in fact, the Book of Abraham. And if he was so upset with the translation, what was his problem before? Because we had uh, published with the Book of Abraham a number of the hieroglyphs. Um, I disagree. The manuscript has been found. Found, and it's obvious you would say it hadn't because it shows that Joseph Smith was not the prophet of God and the Book of Mormon was a fraud. And with that, uh, we once again are running out of time. I want to thank Richard Hopkins, an independent Mormon scholar in the area of theology with a special interest in the evangelical movement. He's now authoring a book which will present a biblical response to evangelical criticism of Mormon theology. I want to thank you, Richard, for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I want to thank Dr. Robert Morey for being in studio as well. He's written a book which I think is just excellent. It's entitled How to Answer a Mormon, Practical Guidelines for What to Expect and What to Reply When the Mormons Come to Your Door. On behalf of the Christian Research Institute, I want to thank all of you who have listened. And I think the real issue is this, that each one of you needs to equip yourselves for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up and strengthened. This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation. For more of Dr. Morey's videotapes, audio presentations, books, and tracts, contact Faith Defenders, P.O. Box 7447, Orange, California, 92863.